Yo, have anyone seen my wallet and my keys running around? Yeah, I need to run out to Hobby Lobby. I gotta pick up some chain order to finish an order. Yeah, it's those keys with the bullet on the key ring. Ah, well, never mind. Found it. Got it. Perfect. All right, I got everything I need to go. I'll be back shortly. Just gonna pick up chain. No more, no less. All right, see you guys later. One hour later. Damn you, Hobby Lobby. Damn you and your enticingly great 40% off plastic bottle kit sales. I literally did not stand a chance. All right, let's see what we got. All right, that's a fun one, but mm, maybe later. Ah, this is what I'll start with. All right, where are my black gloves at? Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 132nd scale M48A2 patent tank. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at EastCoastArmory.com. Also, this model here is a little bit different compared to my standard model showcase videos where those models are primarily built out of the box. This one here, I actually went ahead and spent a lot of time with modifying and upgrading a lot of the surface detailing that's found on this original kit. In this video, I'm going to give the original kit a thorough inbox review, and I'm also going to describe the work that went into the model, upgrading it to the condition that we see it here. So stay tuned because there's going to be a ton of info that's going to be flying right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the M48A2 patent tank. The A2 was the next iteration in the M48 family. The M48 itself was the first brand new post-World War II tank design that was developed by the U.S. military. The vehicles entered into production in the 1952 time frame. Shortly after the M48 and M48-81 started seeing service, a few areas of improvement started to emerge. These concerns were going to be addressed with the new iteration, which was going to be designated the A2. These areas would include both some performance enhancements, but also mostly these changes were made in order to streamline the vehicle's design, making it easier to mass produce. The biggest change that was made to the A2 design was with the complete and utter redesign of the rear engine deck. The engine also was slightly redesigned as well. The original Continental V12 gasoline engine was modified by replacing the carburetors with a new system that was going to be fuel injected. Because of this new redesigned engine, the entire engine deck was changed to better fit it. The entire engine deck found on the previous vehicle was basically very similar to what was seen on the M46 and the M47 patent which it had a very large grill area and was actually very, very complex in order to produce. This new engine deck was going to reduce the amount of grill work found on there and was going to increase the amount of axis hatches that were going to be present. The exhaust manifold was also redesigned. The original pattern had the exhaust emerge from the rear portion of the engine deck and then there was a diffuser that basically tried to redirect the exhaust smoke out to the sides of the vehicle. The other issue that was common on the M early production M48s was with the limited or lack thereof of any access to the transmission. To address these issues, the rear portion of the hull was redesigned where you have these two really large diffuser type grill systems. These grills were on two large hinges and so the things can open up which will give anyone who wants to work on the transmission really good access to these components. The exhaust basically was rerouted so that it emerges just short of the little diffuser systems so when the exhaust mode is emitted from the engine it passes through the diffuser and then out into the environment. Aside from the engine deck being revised, the vehicle's tin work needs to have been changed as well. Many of the fittings which were present on the older patterns of vehicles were completely changed along with their geometry. Rather than a rounded fender type system, we now see angular 
type bends, which was easier to produce. The Little Joe auxiliary generator exhaust was remounted on the front portion where it was adjacent to the driver's hatch. The vehicle's lighting cluster was also redesigned. The older pattern units featured independent bulbs found in their housings, which were arranged on an elaborate brush guard type system. The new redesigned units were going to consolidate all these separate bulbs into a single cast aluminum housing that was going to be mounted on the bow of the vehicle. Along with this new simplified headlight cluster, the brush guards were also simplified to again speed up production. Something else that was going to be redesigned was with the amount of return rollers that were found on the hull. The original M481 utilized five of these small little return rollers along with a trailing idler right below the sprocket. It was deemed that the number of parts was really not necessary in order for the tank to perform and so the new redesign was going to limit the amount of return rollers from 5 to 3 and the trailing idler was something that too was going to be phased out. Although the trailing idler was a feature that was going to be dropped, it really wasn't until the M488A3 was when this little bit of equipment was completely removed and was no longer present. By the end of the 1950s, the M488A2 entered into full production. Not only was the vehicle being produced as new, brand new off-the-shelf tanks, but also many of the older M48s and M48A1s were reconfigured and modernized to A2 specifications. However, on these vehicles, several of the early features, like the five return rollers, were retained. The U.S. military produced a large number of these vehicles, and not only were they used extensively by the U.S. military, they were also widely exported to NATO countries, where many of these vehicles saw service far beyond the usage of the U.S. military. Although the M488A2 was in widespread U.S. military service during the Vietnam conflict era, not many of these vehicles were actually deployed to Southeast Asia. The majority of the patents that were seen during that conflict were M48A3s. However, there are a few photographs of vehicles that are M48A2s that were taken in Vietnam. One of them is definitely confirmed, however the others can possibly be M48A2s which were then upgraded to A3 status prior to being sent off to Southeast Asia. Post-Vietnam, the M48A2s that were still in U.S. military service were really starting to show their age, and by this point here, they were either relegated to National Guard or Army Reserve units. Over the years, these vehicles would be upgraded further by replacing the gas engine with a diesel engine, and eventually the vehicles would be retrofitted into M48A5s. Probably the biggest contribution that the A2 had to U.S. armor design was that this vehicle here set the template on how the U.S. would design the rear engine decks on the vehicles that came afterwards. If you look at the later versions of the M48 the, and the M60, they utilize the exact same engine deck layout. Even the M1 Abrams has several design cues which are borrowed from this design of tank. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this vintage monogram tooling M48A2 packing kit. And as we've seen illustrated in the pre-video bumper, this model here is a very recent addition to the stash and was procured from Hobby Lobby in pretty much the exact same way that was dramatized in the pre-video bumper. Having said that, however, this kit here was one of those subject matters that I've always wanted to do a proper YouTube kit review and model showcase video for because this kit here is, quite frankly put, very prolific and is extremely easily come by. This kit here I've seen in just about every single store and shop that I frequent when I'm out and about getting supplies, so it's been on the radar for quite some time. Aside from that, since this kit here is a vintage plastic bottle kit and this channel has been known to showcase a lot of the older tooling kits from time to time, our pats were bound to cross at some point, and honestly, this video is a tad bit overdue. And with a third and final layer of icing on this layer cake, this model here does hold a special place for me personally because this is not the first time I've actually tackled one of these kits. In fact, when I was a little kid, the Monogram M48A2 packing kit was one of the very first plastic tank model kits that I ever built. In fact, that model is still sitting in my collection and chances are really good it's going to make a guest star cameo appearance in this video towards the latter half. But we'll be getting to that at that time. Let's now get to the kit that we have here at hand. And the kit at hand, of course, is the legendary Monogram M48A2 patent tank. This kit here is really one that doesn't need much of an introduction. 
This kit is probably one of the oldest plastic tank model kits that have been on the market now since its original release back in the way back of 1958. And yes, you did hear me correctly, and I did not misspeak when I said that this kit here was released originally back in 1958. This model here has been re-released and reintroduced several times throughout the decades since that original release, and the only thing that has changed throughout all of those decades is just the appearance on the exterior box art. The interior tooling of the kit itself has remained identical all the way since its original release back then. In fact, if I take this kit here and compare it with one of the original kit releases that are still left in its unassembled state, the two will be absolutely identical and interchangeable with each other. In fact, on a, another one of my vintage tank build videos, one of my viewers asked a question on which tank was one of the oldest kits that were produced. And although it's not this one here, but I will say that the Monogram M48A2 kit is definitely a contender, in, at least in the top five. To understand exactly how good this kit was, let's go ahead and rewind our clocks back to 1958. Dwight D. Eisenhower is the president, the space race is heating up, and you can drive a car without a seatbelt. In fact, no one knows what the hell a seatbelt even is. During this era, the market for plastic model kits was really a new and upcoming thing. During this era, the majority of the big plastic model kit companies were located in the United States. You did have several other upstarts starting off in Japan like Nichimo, Ataki, and Fujimi, or even in Europe like Airfix, for instance, but the big companies were indeed the American ones. And these names are companies that we all know of today, like Monogram, Revell. You also had Aurora, Lifelike, Renwalt, and Limburg. All these companies were developing plastic model kits of this time in a smattering of different genres, from space exploration, this is the 50s of course, as well as airplanes, cars, and for the purpose of this video, military vehicles. Now in terms for military vehicle model kits, there wasn't really an established scale. All of the companies that I just mentioned were producing kits in a variety of different off scales at this given time. It wasn't, of course, until the late 1960s was when Tamiya would officially come out with the 135th scale, and that would be the de facto standard for plastic tank model kits. But before that time, you would have lifelike producing kits, say, in 150, Aurora in 148, Renwall would be working in 132, and Monogram would also kind of hitch their wagon to that type of uh, scale as well. The M48 kit that you see here is really 132nd scale, which is slightly bigger, of course, than what we're used to seeing today in 135. To make things even more interesting, during this time period, the US military really just adopted and started fielding the M48A2 patent tank. So this kit here was really cutting edge and state of the art of its period. When this kit first dropped in 1958, it was actually the best detailed, the best scaled, and the best engineered plastic tank model kit on the market at that time, bar none. I know that's gonna sound hilarious to people who are used to contemporary model kits of today. In fact, some people are gonna look at this kit and scoff and look at it at a scan, but back then, this thing here was the super kit of the era. In fact, Details and features that we expect as a bare minimum on plastic tank model kits of today were kind of pioneered by this kit that we have here. If you compare this kit here to some of the other contemporaries in the competition, like the Renwall M47 Patton, for instance, or the Revell M4 Sherman kit, this model here is vastly superior. The track on this model here is more representable to the real track compared to the other ones I just mentioned. And the sprocket, for instance, on this kit here is an actual tooth ring sprocket. This is gonna sound hilarious, but on other kits of the period, this was something that was really more or less not done. At the time, you would have a kind of a drawing or a molding of a sprocket tooth ring that was molded onto a plastic cylinder, and this would act as your sprocket. With this kit here, it actually gave you a real sprocket for the track to time on. Being 132nd scale, the model has a nice size to it when it's fully completed. 
In comparison to the other kits of the period, it dwarfs the 148 scale kits from Aurora, as well as the in-between scale kits from companies like Lifelike. The model builds into a nice, sturdy, chunky piece and does have some playability to it. I personally know this all too well, but keep in mind, this was an attribute of the period. Plastic model kits back then were more or less meant for kids to build and play with, and this kit does offer that. The vehicle does have a lot of features that lent itself to that role, which you'll see once I crack the box open and go throughout the build. This kit here was a very popular release from Monogram, so much so that Monogram expanded the 132nd scale kit lineup to offer several versions of the M4 Sherman as well as the M3 Lee, to name a few. In fact, over the years, those kits have also been re-released and reintroduced as time goes on. Another aspect of this kit that kept it as relevant for as long as it's been in existence has been the vehicle subject matter. You see, for the longest period of time, there wasn't really any other options out there for an M48A2 patent kit on the market. This was true literally since the onset of this kit up until the mid-2010s time frame. For the longest period of time, if you wanted to build a patent tank kit, your options were very, very restricted and limited. Let's just say if this was the 1990s, or even, hell, the mid-2000s, for instance, if you wanted m 48 patent rendition, your options were the Tamiya M48A3, the Academy M48A3, which if anyone has watched the Model Showcase video on that kit, you'll know it's nothing more than a copy of the Tamiya kit, so it's the same one, the Academy M48A5, and the Monogram M48A2. That was it. Your only other option for an M48A2 rendition would be to pick up a conversion set from Legends, which was a recent kit that changed the Tamiya rendition from an A3 back to an A2, but that was a recent kit. If you were looking for just a straight up plastic tank kit for the M48A2, you were basically SOL. It wouldn't be up until the mid-2010s timeframe was when Revell Germany would come up with their own new tooling M48A2 kit, as well as Dragon producing their new tooling M48A2 kit as well. Now, if you take all of those attributes that I just mentioned and sprinkle in the fact that this kit is extremely prolific, has fantastic distribution, and the prices of the models are considerably lower compared to the other better tooling contemporary kits on the market, you can see why these kits here, again, have stayed with this for as long as they have been. This kit here I purchased again from Hobby Lobby. The price was originally $24.99, but because I took advantage of that 40% off deal, the kit's price was much lower. In fact, it was pretty much exactly how much my father paid for my other M48A2 patent kit that he bought for me when I was a little kid back in the 90s. But anyway, uh, back to the price tag on this one here. The price tag you see on this is basically average on how much you'll encounter one of these if you see one in the wild. They retail anywhere from the low 20s to the low 30s, and honestly, if you're in the 30s mark, you might want to pass on one of these kits. As cool as they are, the detailing on them is going to be dated on them, and really, if you're going to be in that price range, you might just want to save your pennies a little bit more and upgrade to one of the other newer tooling kits that I mentioned before. Well, let me go ahead and go over the box art. But first, let me just go ahead and cut open the shrink wrap. All right, shrink wrap is off and we are now committed. All right, so here's the box art of the model. Now, this here is the most recent rendition of this kit. In the past, the box arts would have originally been hand-drawn, and then over the decades, Monogram swapped out the, the design with using basically some permeation of this particular kit here, just taking at different camera angles. The typeface and the typography also changed throughout time. The way you see it here was, dates back to 2011, so it's pushing 10 years old now with this particular box design. And we have the Lovebug M48A2 with all the other graffiti drawn on it. Obviously, this was inspired heavily by the Vietnam War, which the original kit released, by the way, utilized different markings, of course, in 58. The US wasn't really involved all that much in the Vietnam War at that time. Or, well, back to the tank at hand. Here you can see that the box art utilizes the model built completely stock out of the box. It's kind of like the old Academy kits of the period where what you see on the box art is basically what you get. So, you know, there's some truth in advertising in that respect. 
The kit also supplies you with several figures. Here we have the tank commander, which looks like he's wearing a World War II tanker outfit. A driver, as well as an infantryman with a M14 and a bayonet attached. I'm not sure, but I think this kit may come with a few more infantry figures, but I'm, again, a bit hazy on the subject, but of course we'll definitely see this once I crack the box open. For the background, we have here just a watermarked image of a bunch of Huey helicopters landing. It's a stock image, I think. It's just more than likely taken during the Vietnam War. And for the title, we have the name of the vehicle, and it's in this scratched, grizzled typeface that we've seen on several other of the Monogram re-release kits that have been released around the same era, like the M3 Lee, as well as their Sherman kits as well. Moving down, you can see, of course, the Monogram Large M logo. The other important information. Note they erroneously labeled the scales 135. That is not true. The vehicle is indeed 132nd. And if you ever compare, and actually, you know what? I will compare this kit at the end of the video to a 135th scale counterpart, and you will definitely see that this vehicle is indeed 132. Moving along, you can see another picture of the kit. And like I said before, the kit does indeed come with more infantry figures in random poses. And this kit does have other decals, which you can render the vehicle either for US military service or for the Israeli army, which of course utilize the M40A2 to great effect during the Six Day War and also the Yom Kippur War. Here we have the side tab. Just a simple drawing of, or I should say a simple side profile photograph of the tank, same typeface, and the other required info. And yet another example of the model from the top. But none of this corporate mumbo jumbo matters to any of us because we are here at the end of the day for the kit contents, which is revealed by taking off the top of the box. Here you can see the parts of the model right here in these two bags. Three if you count the infantrymen. So let's go ahead and dig into these bags now. With the bag open up, here you can see the first runner, which obviously is the upper hull. Now, one thing that's unique about the Monogram Old School Patent Kits is the way the hull is assembled. Because of the bathtub shape of the M48, this was one thing that was always tricky in design-wise, specifically for mold makers. And over the years, there have been several different designs that you know have come and gone. The way Monogram did this approach is with a mosaic type effect, which is kind of similar to how the real ones were made in some ways. Here we have the upper hull. You can note it has part of the final drive actually molded on. Here you can see the front section the, with the frog nose, bow periscopes, headlight locations, as well as these two rails here, which will eventually become part of the tin work once the remainder of the hull gets assembled. Here you can see the uh, hubcaps, note the detailing on them. The headlights and the headlight brush guards are integrally molded as one piece. This is one of the weaker aspects of this build, and these are like some of the details, like I said before, that you're gonna start, the model will start showing its age in that respect. But just something to keep aware of. We have an infantryman over here with a Thompson submachine gun. The World War II type hand commander, and some of the other components like the driver and other fittings for this vehicle. Note the turret dome rangefinders are just domes. There's no other little slit that are molded into them. Here we have the 90 millimeter gun. Note the barrel end is not drilled out. It's just molded solid. It has the T-shaped muzzle brake which again is standard for the 48. Of course, it was also the Y pattern of muzzle brake, but that's neither here or there. The tow hitch mount is one cluster, so it does make for a simple assembly. And even the gypsy rack sections. Note the lower hatch here does have its little spring details molded in. Which again, for the age of the kit's tooling, is actually a pretty nice feature. Digging down deeper takes us to the running gear, which I want to be careful because I don't want to accidentally lose part or two. And here you can see the quality of the row wheels. The row wheels on this model are meant to spin on the swing arm axles, and note the swing arms are separately molded. 
The shapes on them are a bit simplistic, but again, this something like this was considered far superior to the other kits of the era. And here we have the sprockets like I mentioned before. Note the sprockets are missing the the guide horn track guide that is that is a very iconic bit of detailing found in these patent kits, but again, you have to uh, crawl before you walk. Here we have the return rollers. And note this vehicle not only has the ones found on the top portion, but also has the trailing idlers, which was a detail fitting found on the patent vehicles of this era. There's the heater exhaust, jerry cans, and the mini cupola 50 caliber machine gun. Note the over molding on this guy over here. Quite a bit of flash, but again, quite customary again for the era. Cupola hatch and some other cupola components. Air vent, pretty standard. The second runner takes us to the hull, and here you can see the lower hull halves. Note that on this kit here, in order to achieve the shape of the bathtub hull, you will have the hull in two sections that glue together and then just puzzle and mosaic their way into the final overall shape of the M48. Here we have the upper hull. Note here you can see the spare tracks that are molded on. It does have its rigidity straps found on the tin work. Side bins. The tow cable is integrally molded in as well as the track jacks as well as the other tools. The fuel caps and even the grill work. Now although this looks very primitive and very simplistic, all of the details are here and would be found on the real vehicle. Here you can see the engine axis hatches right here on the top portion. No, it even has little lift handles that are integrally molded into the grill work. And even the travel lock is integrally molded on. Of course, this is a grunt compared to the Symphony, which is the Dragon M48A2, or even the A1 kit that was also showcased on this channel in the past. Back to the lower hull, you can see the lower hull components and how the torsion bar systems are rendered. We have the shock absorbers integrally molded into the side as well as the bump stops. And you can even see the small details that were molded in for the fasteners that secure the, the torsion bar mounts to the side of the bathtub hull. Of course, very simplistic, but again, consider the age of the tooling. While on the inside here, here we have some copyright info. Note it's dated for 1966, which of course is interesting because the kits themselves were originally released in 58, but Monogram did re-release these kits in 66 with a different box art and slightly different markings. Perhaps this is the one they're referencing, but I'm not really sure one way or the other. What's also interesting to point out that the info is molded in cockeyed on the center section, and of course, like all, or I should say most things these days, it's it's made in China, as opposed to the original releases, which were, I believe, made in the U.S. But that's going to open up a discussion that is definitely out of the scope of this video, so let's continue on. The last tank runner takes us to the turret, as well as the rear exhaust section. Note the exhaust manifold grills are integrally molded in, as well as the other details. Of course, of course, the toe points are molded solid, but that's something that I'm going to address. And here we have the remainder of the gypsy rack, and it has the bottom portion integrally molded on. And here we have the turret sections. The turret itself doesn't look too bad. It has the appropriate shape to it. We have some more <laughs> corporate info molded on the outside here. And on the turret, really, the one of the biggest dings this kit has is that the side rails are molded into the sides. So this is something that I'm going to address again as the build progresses. But as you can see, it has the proper shape and look for an M48 90mm turret. On the bottom of the box, we have the remainder of the infantry figures. Note they are in different poses. And they have the equipment, gear, and weapons for the what appears to be the mid 1950s time frame which of course would make sense this fellow over here has an m14 with a bayonet the m2 flamethrower guys throwing a grenade some shots of the flamethrower by the way 
And here we have a guy resting prone with his trusty M14. And here we have the model going through its assembly. And at this point here, this is really early on, and I basically just started the first few steps of the model's construction. The reason why I'm taking the time during construction to show this portion of the build is because at this point here, you can really get a good idea on what you're going to expect in terms of how the model goes together, as opposed to when the model's fully assembled, painted and weathered and sitting on the display table that of course we've seen and we'll be seeing again as the video progresses. Now, as we stated before, this kit's tooling is very, very old. And one thing about kits from the 1950s and the early 1960s timeframe that I frequently mention is with the way the parts fit together. If you're used to more modern contemporary kit tooling, like from companies like Tacom, Dragon, or Mank, for instance, this kit here is going to be a bit different from your typical comfort zone. Here we have the lower hull. Now, like I stated before, this was in three separate sections that got glued together to form the basic shape. Now, you could quickly see exactly how the parts fit together, which needless to say, you're gonna need to do a bit of potty work here and further refinement in order to polish this down. If you could see the giant seam running across the section right here, runs along the escape hatch and even up the front portion of the frog nose. With the way the two halves are on their runners, you have quite a substantial tab that holds the side panel to the runner, found right here in the middle panel, as well as right here on the front nose. And of course, this is a mirror image on both sides. So you need to clip those away and sand a little bit of that material away in order to smooth it out. Then once the halves get glued together, you will have this seam that I could get here in the light. Now obviously something like this would be shunned upon on contemporary kits, but this is the type of thing you will expect to see on one of these old vintage monogram patterns. Now fortunately this seam here isn't gonna be a problem. It easily polishes away with simple bodywork with red or green putty. And it's something I'm going to con gonna take care of. But again, I just wanted to show this so that people get a good idea on what you're dealing with. Now, once these two halves are glued together, you then mount on the rear plate. And again, note the fit on these sections right here. So you can see that the addition of some bodywork is greatly gonna be needed on this model. And that's just on the outside, but another thing I wanted to point out was with the inside portion. This was actually something that kind of surprised me because I didn't, I don't remember encountering this when I built my first monogram pattern back in the day. When I was gluing the two halves together, they don't really lock into each other. So you'll have the two sections with glue added and you'll put them together. And then there's really not a whole lot of surface area on both the pegs as well as on the on the thicknesses of the panels themselves so they really want to start falling apart and the, the assembly is a bit flimsy actually now for the glues like i stated generally i just use super glue for all of the components assembly on my models i don't use cement i don't use red tube mono glue perhaps if i was using red tube mono glue this would probably went together a little bit easier i think because of the way it melts things together as opposed to the ca which bonds them differently Anyway, on this one, in order to help bond the two sections together, I need to add some more surface area that bridges the two pieces. So I went ahead and cut some scrap pieces of sheet styrene that I had lying around the shop, and I just glued them to these sections over here, which greatly improves the strength of the lower hull, gives it a little bit more rigidity, because now you have a larger surface area for the glues to adhere to. This may or may not be something you might want to do on your build in case you encounter this problem. When it came time for the installation of the rear plate, I noticed that the curvature here on the hull was different compared to the curvature here found on the rear plate. Once the panel was glued on, I actually had to jig it in my vise where the angle was adjusted and then it made it properly with the rear plate here. So again, this may or may not be something that you might encounter on your own build. So you had to do some weird jigging in order to get these pieces to properly fit. As you can see with the inside here, the piece does plug on, but it's not really what, like again, what you would see on more contemporary kits where you have a large flange that would insert and plug directly into its location. You just have these small little pins that go out and they basically somewhat clip into place. It does the job, but again, it's something that you wouldn't necessarily see on a kit with more modern tooling. Another thing I want to mention is with the side panels and the rear, once you get everything assembled and you let the glues fully set, 
I noticed that on both sides here, the rear plate stood up slightly over the side panels. This may lead to issues when it comes time for progressing with the body insulation, namely with the top portion here. If it's not sitting on properly, you can have a situation where it's sitting somewhat like this. Now this is over exaggerated, of course, but just so you get the idea. In order to square this off, I went ahead and used my file here. And I just slightly went up and down these areas here, removing a little bit of material, just so, and stopping, of course, once the locations were nice and squared off. This leaves itself for a better surface area where it locks on in a more parallel format, which is, again, what you want. While on the hand fitting, one other thing I want to mention involves the side sections here of the hull where we have remnants of either injection pin marks or, I believe, in this case, they're more or less knockout marks. And this, of course, involves with the way the pieces are are tooled and with the way they're molded. Now, on the hull here, they can't really be seen because I already took care of this. But on the upper portion here, I'm still going through the process of revising it so I could easily show you at this time. If we look right here at the front of the bow, you'll see this small little round circle. And there are a few more along the edge here. These are the knockout marks that I was referring to before. Now, the ones here on the sides aren't too bad. They're mostly flat, give or take, a little bit. But here, the one on the front on this example seems to stand up slightly above the leading edge here on the front. And why this needs to be addressed is because when it comes time for fitting or mounting the sections together, that little bit of material can possibly throw off your fit and can lead to a little bit more difficulties during your assembly. Now, luckily, this little bit of material is easily removed with tools such as a needle file, a regular file, or even some sandpaper. And not a whole lot of material needs to be removed in order to get the pieces nice and smooth. Just a few swipes here or there, and you should be good to go. And for good measure, I'm also doing it to the ones on the side just to make sure everything is flat as possible. So with this one here, you can see on this side, I've already taken care of those knockout marks. And if you get into focus, you could probably see how much flatter they look compared to the ones here on the opposite side. And since the last scene, here we have the hull going through its bodywork phase. You can see that I've been going through the paces and blending the seam work together with a little bit of red putty here. Now, this is just the first coat. This is going to be improved upon subsequently as the build progresses past this point. But I do want to bring up one of the weaker aspects on this build, and that involves the suspension. Not necessarily the swing arms or the row wheels, but also with the shock absorbers and the bump stops. Now here you can see this is another aspect of this kit that is a representation of the time where this kit was designed. You'll notice that on this portion here, all of the side details are integrally molded onto the lower hull pan. Because of this, this is going to give you detailing that's going to be on the very, very simplistic and softer end. Now, normally, I would actually keep the molding in details on any other build, but on this one, I'm actually going to be doing something different. You'll notice that on this side here, I went ahead and deleted all of this molding and detailing, and this was done via a Dremel with a high-speed removal bit. Specifically, this one that we have over here. With combination of some sandpaper and a X-Acto knife, I was able to clean these sections off. Now, if anyone's wondering, well, John, why exactly are you doing that? Well, the answer is quite simple, is that I have replacement details for these exact same fittings. And those details are found on these runners that we have right here. Note, these are the shock absorbers. And here we have some of the bump stops. These runners here are left over from a multitude of several of the Dragon M48 and M103 series of kits that I've done throughout the years on this channel. And if anyone has ever built any of those kits, you'll know that one byproduct of those Dragon patent or patent-based vehicle kits is that you have a lot of spare parts. And because of those spare parts, they can easily enhance something like this older kit that we have here. Which is why, by the way, rule of thumb, never throw out your spare parts. They can always come in handy when you least expect it. But, of course, in order to mount on the new components, the old ones need to go. Now, once the same procedure is done to this side here, the entire lower section is going to be covered with a layer of red putty, which will act as a nice medium for the cast texturing, which is generally seen on a lot of my builds.
I'm pretty sure that a few people watching this video are gonna say, well, John, since you have all these Dragon Patton parts on hand, why not just replace the entire suspension on this vehicle? Namely, the, you know, the swing arm mounts, the swing arms, the track, the wheels, you know, basically everything hull down. This may come to a shock to some people, but I'm not going to replace any other parts on the suspension, namely the swing arm mounts, the swing arms, the row wheels, and even the track. The sprockets I'm on the fence about at this point if I'm going to keep the kit ones or swap them out with the Dragon ones, but realistically I'm just going to be keeping primarily most of the stock suspension parts on this build. And I'm pretty sure people are watching this, or a few people are watching this and saying, well John, why? You literally have probably enough parts here either on this table or in my spare parts bin to outrig the entire tank with a new suspension set. My answer to that is, well, honestly, it's not really worth it in the end. One of the big reasons why I'm not going to do that and I'm actually going to keep the stock suspension is because of the scale discrepancies between the two parts. This kit here is 132nd scale and these parts here are 135. For smaller fittings like, you know, the bump stops or the shock absorbers, these should pass through pretty well without being too much of a concern, but when you have bigger assemblies like suspension parts and sprockets, this may cause some problems. Now when it comes to the sprockets, I'm actually on the fence on if I'm going to keep the stock original ones or replace those with the Dragon ones. That remains to be seen and I'll touch upon that shortly, but right now when it comes to the remainder of suspension parts, I'm just going to keep the stock ones. Now I know this is going to really tie into the skill level and recommendation portion that are generally, you know, reserved to the end of the video, but spoiler alert, if you're looking for a super scale accurate M48A2, really, this is not going to be the kit for you. So if you have intentions on buying one of these older monogram kits and decking it out to the nines, replacing every little aspect of it to make it a scale accurate piece, really, you're barking up the wrong tree, and this is not the vehicle for that. This is a vintage kit outright. Yeah, you can build it well out of the box and have fun with it. Or you could do what I'm doing to it, which is, you know, lightly polishing it a little bit. It's, you know, kind of like a cake or, you know, like a, a good steak. You know, sometimes the cut of meat is not exactly going to be the best. But just because the cut of meat isn't that good, that doesn't mean you can't improve it with, you know, some spices and herbs here or there. And that's basically what I'm doing here. These additions here are really spices to what would normally be a dried up cheap cut of meat. Well, as the build goes on, here you can see the modifications have been made to the hull. At this point here, the hull is ready for its upper hull counterpart to be fitted. But with it off, you get a really good look at the lower portions in more depth. Note quite clearly, you can see the addition of the cast texturing that has been applied to all of the lower hull surfaces. This completely blends in all of the glued together seam surfaces, at least for a nice seamless look. And what's interesting to point out is as primitive as this kit is, you have to give Monogram credit. They did go ahead and get the shape of the M48 bathtub hull, for the most part, actually pretty well. Moving on, takes to the suspension. The stock swing arms were mounted, but you can see how they were improved with the Dragon M48 spare parts that I mentioned before. These components were just dropped into the corresponding locations where they would have been found on the real one and, or, or I should say, would have been found on the original monogram tooling. Uh, luckily, I have a Dragon kit in the stash, so I was able to look at the instructions just to verify which pieces go where and with their proper orientation. With that on hand, I was able to get the lower hull outfitted to the way you see it here. Now, like I stated before, I was on the fence on whether whether or not I'm going to keep the original sprockets. And for this build, I'm actually going to keep the original ones for the sheer simple reason that I was unable to find any spare sprockets on hand. I had enough parts to make one, but not the other. And I really didn't feel like making a mold for this one. So for this build here, I'm just going to stick with the stock sprockets. But at least the under portions here are improved with having the separate details compared to the original molded in ones. Along that note, the next area that I went ahead and improved was the rear detailing. Note the change of the taillights. The original molded in ones were amputated, and in their place I dropped these two spare Dragon M48 pattern of taillights directly in their place. The stock ones are very basic in their overall detailing, and they pale in comparison to the modern tooling Dragon units. Luckily with the way the kit is designed, the taillights are solid plastic. There's no little cavity found on the inside, which like for instance what was found here on the 
shock absorbers found on the sides which required the addition of the extra putty work. For this section here I just removed the material with a Dremel with a high speed removal bit and then these units just dropped directly in place. These are greatly improved compared to the kit ones like I mentioned before. On a similar note, that's also true for the tow hitch. The stock do kit does give you a tow hitch, but again, it's clunky in its overall shape. This one here is a spare from Academy Tooling. This is actually a leftover part from my AFV Club CM11 build that I did a number of years ago. In that in that build video, you'll note that the that kit is a combination of the Academy M60A1 and the Academy M48A5. And with the way the parts are laid out, you will have an extra tow hitch on hand with the tooling. So again, rather than having to waste any more years sitting in my spare bin, I just dropped it directly in place on this one here, and it greatly improves the look of it. While in this area, you'll notice I drilled out these two sections here for the tow points. These are integrally molded into the rear plate, but are solid, and so just a short work with a pin vise and a Dremel bit are all that's needed to drill them out, which is a quick, quick, easy way to bring up the model's accuracy. With the hull going through its construction and going through its paces, this now leads me to the tank's upper hull and an extension, the turret. You see with the Monogram M48A2 patent kit, it actually assembles this in a very unique way and something that's completely different from all the other kits that are on the market in 135 as well as in 132. Traditionally, kits have a hole that's integrally molded into the top deck with two little recesses found on these sections here and then there would be corresponding locks found on the bottom portion of the turret. Turret would then rotate into its little sweet spot, you would twist it and it holds it and secures it to the vehicle. Other kits utilize the friction system where you have a neck descending from the turret bottom pan and it would slide into a large hole found on the roof and with the way the pieces are designed the fit is so tight that it holds the turret snug onto the model. Monogram, however, went ahead and utilized a different system. Their system more closely resembles a 176 scale tank as opposed to some of the kits in larger scale, where we have a peg and hole type system. The way this works is that you would assemble the turret as one piece and then when it came time for assembly you would drop the turret in and then with a little peg or I should say a little ring you would glue it to the peg and once the glue set the turret is now permanently attached to the upper hull and it can't come off. Why this is important is this will affect how you assemble the model in its assembly stages. Generally you would build the lower hull, the suspension, move up to the upper hull and then the turret would be done last and the turret of course just drops directly in place and it even helps to paint it when the turret is off of course. Well with this one here you're gonna have to do things a slightly different format because obviously once this gets glued onto the top or to the lower hull you're not gonna be able to install the turret permanently now are you? So with this one here I'm gonna have to do a slightly different technique and I'll touch upon that in the next couple scenes. While working on the turret, there's one little detail I want to point out, something that's pretty unique, I've never seen it before, which is why I want to mention it, and that's with this little stamp that we have right here on the inside. It's done at the factory, and it looks like it's done with flexography, which is basically like a rubber stamp that, you know, a machine stamps a pad and then stamps onto the object. You see a lot in those How It's Made videos, but I've never seen something like this found on a plastic molecule before, so I just wanted to point that out. Obviously, this is something that was not found on the older releases of this kit. Probably one of the biggest dings on this older school kit is the fact that the monogram kit has the side grab handles here integrally molded onto the turret sides like I mentioned earlier. As a quick recap, here we see on this side here the tooling left stock. And obviously this does detract from the look of the build. So what I went ahead and did was with an X-Acto knife, I just basically carved and scraped the side section here until the molding and grab handle was completely flushed away. And then with some sandpaper, I just went ahead and smoothed over the surface. More than likely, the turret is going to be getting a coat of cast texturing to it just to smooth everything over, which was seen like, for instance, on my vintage Tamiya M60A1 build, but more information on that, of course, is to follow. Before I go ahead and do that, I am going to go ahead and do the exact same procedure to this side. Luckily, just like with the tail light on the inside here, the tooling is nice and thick with the amount of plastic that's found on this molding here. So when you remove this, you're not gonna have any cavities remaining when the piece is sanded flush. After the grab handle is removed, before I can go ahead and get the upper and lower halves together, I need to first mount on the commander's cupola. 
The cupola itself assembles pretty easily. This is probably going to go through some further refinement, but you'll notice that the machine gun has to be fitted to this portion here because with the way the kit is designed, it's not like the Tamiya or the Dragon Kit where the cupola can just drop in and rotate in place. This one here, just like with the turret, it's held in place by three little pegs that sandwich it onto the turret itself, but it keeps it nice and sturdy, but it allows the pieces to rotate. Obviously, you can't exactly install this once the turret has our glued together, so this is something that I'm going to have to mount on permanently after the bodywork is concluded. Another thing that needs to be added before the turret has got fitted is the 90mm gun or the rotor for the mantlet. I know from personal experience, once the turret is fully assembled, you're not going to be able to get this component in place, which is a complete contradiction, by the way, to the instruction sheet because you follow the instructions right here. Note, it wants you to glue the halves together and then the barrel should just plug directly into place. Well, I can speak from personal experience that if you do this, that's not the case. The piece will not be able to fit in, and you're not going to have any rotation. Why this was never addressed in the instructions, even up into 2011 when this kit was re-released, is your guess as much as it is mine. But I can tell you for a fact, if you want the gun barrel to elevate correctly, you are going to need to assemble all of these components over here and then fit them before you sandwich the turret halves together. So keep that in mind in case you're working on one of these old school monogram M48s. Well, here we now have the model just about ready for painting. At this point here, the upper hull is not yet glued to the lower for the reasons that I mentioned before. While I have this opportunity though, I might as well review the turret. Here you can see the turret now fully completed and at this point it's ready for painting. Just like with the hull, I went ahead and raided my spare parts bin in order to kick the model up further from its kit original vintage offering. Starting with the gun barrel, you'll see I swapped out the original 90mm brake and bore evacuator with a unit from Dragon. This was a spare piece that I had on hand, and again, so rather than having it languish in my spare parts bin, I just utilized it for this build. The Dragon component is very nicely detailed and drops directly onto the stock barrel. Here we have the original barrel in comparison, and you get to see exactly how much more advanced the Dragon one is compared to the original kit offering. Now the kit original component is far from being unsalvageable, in fact if I didn't have this component on hand I would have just simply kept this one and just cleaned it up, making it look more representable. But again, just like with all the other details on this model, out of convenience I might as well just use the better components that have just been sitting languishing in my spare parts bin. Moving back from the muzzle brake takes to the mantlet, you can see some more mods that were made to it. The mantlet did have the lift rings molded in, but they were very amorphous in their overall shape, so I went ahead and simply just amputated them completely and replaced them with two new units, which were spare from the Dragon set. Along those lines, another thing to mention about the mantlet on these monogram kits is that there is an inaccuracy where they have the coax and the optic switched on them and it's one of the dings that are found on this kit. Fortunately it's not too hard of a ding to fix up. On this portion here I eliminated the molded in machine gun detailing and replaced it with an optic insert from the Dragon Patton. The piece is made out of clear plastic and will clean up pretty well after the unit is fully painted. On this side here the original optic section was completely removed and I went ahead and replaced it with a small piece of plastic kit runner. After the model is fully painted, I'm going to mount on a Dragon Flash Suppressor for the proper coaxial machine gun, which would be present on the real vehicle. From the mantlet, now takes it to side detailing, and we'll first start with the two rangefinders. These are clearly, pun definitely intended, leftovers and spares from the Dragon kit. The Dragon unit does have some very nice detailing to it, and again, just like with the other optic here, after the unit is painted, the lens sections should clean up pretty well. This is a nice step up from the original kit supplied units, which do have some nice geometry to them. However, you'll notice that they are missing any sort of their optic slit detailing, which would be present on these pieces. The Dragon ones just drop directly into place with really no mods needed. The only thing that I added in order to fit these in place is with a Dremel with a router bit like this small little unit over here. I just carved away the material found on the turret in order to have the clearance for the little peg to clip onto. You could possibly install these by simply just snipping off the peg on the plastic piece. Either way will get you to the same result. 
From the dome takes us to the grab handles, and this is probably one of the biggest dings on these old school monogram patent kits. So much so that even if I wasn't upgrading this model with any spare detail parts, I would have still remove the molded in wedge and replace it with some sort of grab handle detailing because it just really helps improve the model that much more. For this build here, the wedge was sanded away and I replaced it with these two grab handles that we have here on either side. These grab handles are actually spares from a Eshi M60A1 model that I built a number of years ago and I had just the handles loitering around the spare bin. The M60A1 handles are very similar to the ones found on the M48. The biggest difference is that the 60 ones are, are somewhat longer due to the elongated shape of the M60A1 turret. In order to have them fit the 48, basically I just snipped away the two rear portions of the handles here, and then they just mounted directly in place. They do need a little bit of a slight reworking in order for it to better fit on the different curvature and geometry of the M48 turret. However, once they're fitted, they greatly improve the look of the model compared to leaving that wedge in place. Now, let's just say for the sake of argument that I did not have these grab handles on hand, I would have still went ahead and fabricated this bit of detailing for the reasons that I mentioned before. If I was doing it again, I'd probably go ahead and make these little stems here out of pieces of sheet styrene or styrene strip, affix them to the model, and then with a piece of wire or some other plastic rod, I would have fabricated the detailing here for the side handles. So again, this is something that I strongly recommend for someone that has the capabilities to do some slight scratch building. Moving further takes us to the gunner's optic box. This is another area where I slightly tweaked from the kit original. Originally, this whole unit would have been molded solid, and in order to improve the look, with the aid of a Dremel and with a needle file, I went ahead and cleaned out this area here, giving the piece more depth. Carrying on further brings us to the turret surface itself. You'll notice that the entire surface of the turret, both top and bottom, has been covered with the cast texturing, which, just like with the hull that I mentioned before, is something that immensely improves the look of the, the model. And again, this is something that I would have done even if I would have built the model without the extra details that I've been mentioning in this video. Back to the upper hull, you can see that the fuel filler caps were deleted and new Dragon ones were mounted in place. Just another piece of why not detailing. On the front here, there's still a little bit more that needs to be added after the upper gets mounted, but here you can see the headlights that have been mounted. The original kit supply headlights are extremely simplistic and basic, which we all come to expect. So in their place, I swapped them out with these two units that we have here. These units are spare from an Academy M60A1 that I built a little while ago. The headlights just drop directly into place without any other mods. I am also going to be adding the fire extinguisher box, but that I'm going to be discussing that a little bit later. Along similar lines, the original molded in bow periscopes were amputated and in their place, I have these three units that have been fitted. These units here, I actually made a mold of them because I lost one on another dragon build that I built a little while ago. So since I had the mold sitting idle, I might as well make some castings on it and I dropped these new units directly in place thus improving the periscope detailing on this build. After the hull gets fitted, I'm going to fabricate the brush guards, as well as add some of the other very final bits of detailing that still need to be added. Before I do that though, I am going to go ahead and paint the lower portion of the tart with its primer, as well as this section here with not only the primer and the base coat, and then I'm going to go ahead and permanently affix the turret. You'll notice I went ahead and taped up the bottom portions here. This is just to prevent paint from getting into these areas, which can lead to the turret sticking to the model. And if you have plastic on smooth plastic, the turrets tend to rotate a little bit smoother. Briefly, one other thing I want to mention is that on the inner portions here of the tin work, you can see a little bit of some mold schmutz, I guess is the best way to put it. So with a Dremel with a high speed removal bit, I'm just going to polish that away, making for a nice smooth surface. It's just one of those little things that are found on these older kits, and it's one that can easily be fixed. On the lower hull here, the only thing I want to mention is with the final drives. With the way the kit is designed, you have these two little pegs that get glued onto the inside here, and then the sprocket's secured to that. Rather than going with that approach, I'm actually going to replace it with a steel rod, which will give you more support on the 
sprockets, making the model a little bit stronger. However, in order to do that, I'm going to need to take a drill bit and drill out this little section over here of plastic, which will then allow clearance for the steel rod to get slid in during that portion of the assembly. Now that the model is fully completed, you can really see how some of those details that I touched upon really do glow and enhance the model compared to the original offering. Starting with the suspension, all of those shock absorber and bump stop details are really popping out, along with, of course, the cast texturing that I added to not just the lower all, but most of the extremities on this vehicle. The remainder of the running gear is all left stock. This would include the wheels, the return rollers, as well as the sprocket, and of course, this would also include the track. The components, although are a bit simplistic compared to what we expect today, are still good enough for the job at hand, and they do give you the look and feel of the Patton's running gear. One really nice feature that this model does have is that the tracks are very flexible, and because of that, the model does have some playability to it, where, yes, you can actually drag this model across the carpet, and the suspension will work. With the way the wheels are designed, the hubcap is what's glued onto the axle, thus preventing the wheels from falling off, but it allows them to rotate. This is true for all of the main wheels, as well as the smaller return rollers that are present on this vehicle. Of course, with that in mind, you don't want it to continually do that with your build because, of course, over time, the paints will chip off on you. However, there are a bunch of viewers out there that watch my videos that frequently ask me, can the model be played with on the rug? And if you're one of those individuals, yes, the Monogram m 4882 would be a model for you. Also, one thing that I may have touched upon earlier is that with this particular re-release here is that the track material is very flexible, and this is something that was different compared to the other M4882 that I built when I was younger. That one, the tracks were very, very stiff, so much so that you probably would end up breaking some of the parts during the installation. With this one here, that wasn't the case. The tracks assembled without any problems and went on equally as easy. During the installation, in order to prevent any sort of breakage of the swing arms, the track is installed before the wheels are mounted on. Basically, you take the track, wrap it around the sprocket, as well as the front wheel over here, you just slip it into their appropriate locations, and then the remainder of the wheels just get mounted in their place. By doing this, this alleviates any sort of potential stress that you may have if you're trying to put the tracks on with the wheels already present, because this is going to max out the tension found on these pieces, and if you're not careful, you can easily crack one of the swing arms. The swing arms on this model here are probably one of the weaker aspects in ruggedness, and again, this is true for basically all tank kits, but if you're trying to build this model, bear that in mind, and if the swing arm cracks, it's not unfixable, but it is definitely going to add some complications to your build. One change that I did make, however, involves the way the sprockets are fitted. Like I touched upon earlier, the sprockets are originally designed to have a plastic peg that gets glued to the end of the sprocket, and the other end is housed inside the final drive. Because of this technique, the sprocket can rotate freely, but it prevents it from falling out. The design does work, and obviously with as old and as successful as these kits are, they... It, works as advertised. However, I had to change this because of the way I assemble my models. Like I stated before, the sprockets and the track are mounted in unison at the tail end of the build, and because of that, the stock system really wouldn't work. The original peg is too short, and if I try to install it in that manner, it's just going to pop off on the inside and rattle around loose. This is something that's definitely not ideal. So, in its place, I redesigned the system to have a single brass rod that runs across the two final drives, and the two sprockets connect to the single metal rod. This design is very similar, actually it's identical to the design that I use on my Dragon build for the exact same reasons. The design, or I should say the adjustment, is more than durable enough to hold the sprockets at bay and preventing any sort of track tension to cause any issues. But the sprockets can also spin freely, like I showcased earlier when I was able to illustrate the movement of the tracks. Bouncing to the track, the components here, of course, are the kit supplied units and, in my opinion, do the job on this build very well. They have some decent detailing on the surface and you do get the look and feel of the 
M48 type track. Just like with the other patent based vehicles that are found on this channel, the tracks are painted in the exact same format, where you have the rubber sections painted to look like rubber. This is true for both the interior as well as the exterior. And all of the metal sections are painted to have this rusty type coloring, which of course would be common on vehicles from this era. One thing I liked about the tracks, like I touched upon before, is the material that they're molded in is very flexible, so assembling them with the tongue and groove type format was very easily done. I did add a small little drop of super glue just to make sure that the tongue and groove system stays where it needs to be. However, this is not something that is necessarily mandatory. However, it is one that I do recommend. Going back to the rear, you can see the rear tail lights. These are the same Dragon units that I touched upon before, but here you can see what they look like fully painted. Just like on all American vehicles of the era, they follow the same format. The tail light here on the left hand side, the cat's eye portion on the top is painted in red, while the one on the opposite side, it's blacked out. This is something that's very easily done, and if done, it really does make the model pop. It's also one of those things that really doesn't take a whole lot of extra effort by the builder in order to improve their builds. Hopping back to the front to the frog nose, you really get to appreciate the bow scratch build details now, of course, with the model fully completed. The brush guard and headlight setup are probably one of the weaker aspects found on the original monogram kit. And if you go ahead and put forth a little extra effort like I did here, it's a really great way to spice up the build, bringing it up to really quality levels that are similar to its contemporary releases. While on that section, you can also see the front lift lugs that I borrowed from the Dragon kit. Again, just sprinkling on a few little details here and there are probably some of the best ways to improve upon an older kit like this one here. Moving upward, you can see the fire extinguisher box. Of course, it is painted red, which was customary on vehicles from this era. Bouncing back to the headlights, when you're painting headlights with this type of a cluster, it's always in this type of format. The headlight on the left hand side would be silver and then the blackout light would always be the one found on the right hand portion. This setup is found on not just the M48A2 but also the M48A5 and uh, most notably on the M60. Moving along the tin work takes us to the molded in tool sets. These ones here are left completely stock and I didn't see the need to amputate them and try to replace them. This could be done but it is going to require a bit of work as well as some extra scratch building which for this build here I in my opinion wasn't really necessary. The tools were simply just painted carefully after of course the model was painted and weathered and then everything just blended into the way you see it here. You notice on this one here I left the tool handles painted in a olive dress type coloring, which is something that is definitely seen on military vehicles, specifically found in the U.S. Army. Now, you have an option. You could either paint them in the olive drab format that I have here, but it's also not uncommon to see wooden tool handles left with the original wood coloring. This is something that's up to the discretion of the builder, and it's really up to your personal taste. A similar technique was also utilized on the two front spare track links that are found on the tin work. One thing I want to point out, and this is something that really separates a novice builder from an experienced builder, is how to paint equipment that's either tools or other sections that are molded in. Some novice builders out there will just overpaint everything with one color or possibly two colors and then call it a day. While someone that has a little bit more experience will go ahead and take the time to carefully paint over the straps depending on what material they are. For instance, right here on the tools, the straps that are holding down the shovel head as well as the axe head over here are actually part of the tank and because of that they're going to be painted with the same color as the base coat that we see on the, re the remainder of the vehicle. While the tie downs that hold on to the wooden sections, these on this pattern of vehicle would be green nylon webbing type straps like you see right here on the spare jerry can. By painting these with the similar colors, this is a nice easy way to make your model shine and again, it's one of those little things that shows that you put a little bit more effort into your build compared to just leaving everything just over painted. Also while on the sides you can see the molded in tow cables which are present on both sides of the mall have also been painted and weathered in a similar format. In order to paint the cables, the middle section here is painted in flat black and I just went ahead and dry brushed the, the aluminum color here to give that worn look. The end connectors are painted in dark olive drab, which is what would be present on toe eye fittings during this era. 
Moving up takes us to the turret, and there's nothing really much more to add upon what I already stated before, but you can see how some of the pieces are painted differently. Like right here, the antenna base is painted with a different shade of all drab compared to the remainder of the vehicle. These are for the same reasons that I touched upon before with the tools. And again, it's just another way to add a little bit more extra flavor to your build. The two jerry cans mounted on the side are painted with the top portions in red. This is to signify that the jerry can holds gasoline in it, which would be appropriate for this vehicle because the M48A2 Patton was a gasoline powered vehicle. In fact, if we can recall to the beginning portion of the video where in the background I actually have a real jerry can painted in this configuration for the exact same reasons. The Weathering on the jerry can, you'll notice I use my typical technique where around the cap section I added a little bit of spillage, which again is not uncommon. If anyone has ever handled a real jerry can before, you'll know what I'm talking about. And while on the spillage, you can see the same detail effects added right here to the fuel spiller, filler spout. This is done with a little bit of gloss black, and then afterwards with a little brush of gloss lacquer, it gives you that little sheen that we've all seen if you've ever spilled and poured gasoline before on any type of implement. Moving along, you can see the other details found on the turret. These are all the p details that I touched upon before, but again, now that everything is fully painted weather, you really get to appreciate it more compared to the hodgepodge Franken tank setup that this thing looked like earlier. For instance, on the M2HB, now that everything is weathered, you really see those cooling shroud mods that I added with the pin vise. And all those dragon components just really fit perfectly in on this build. Of course, the original kit's functional hatches are still fully functional. And they open up without any problems. I did paint the inside portions. It's just a very simplistic paint job. and But it's one that, of course, makes everything look all that much better. Moving along takes to the paint and the markings. This model here is painted with a dark shade of olive drab, which is what would be common on US military vehicles from the 1950s time frame. This being an M48A2, this color is more than appropriate for this subject matter at hand. The color itself is my own custom mix and it's something that I've touched upon in several of the other model showcase videos on this channel with similar subject matters. The weathering is also my typical technique where I use a cocktail of different color washes in order to achieve the sun faded look that we have here and then wrapping everything up is the dry brushing technique which gives you the chipped up and scratched surfaces that are present on this build. From the paint and the weathering takes us to the markings. The markings on this model here are a mix between the stock water slide decals as well as several other spare decals that I had in my bin. The stock water slide decals are actually really good in their quality and go on without any problems and varnish on equally as well. The one hurdle though that you're going to have with the stock water slide decals is that these are really representing of a time that they were made in and they are an identical copy to the original decals which were supplied with these kits back in the 1970s. The decals have some strange quirks to them, namely with the front Tioni markings where they are far too large for the type of markings which would be present on these vehicles. And that's not to mention all the weird strange hippie graffiti that's also present on the decal sheet. For the remainder of the decals, you see here a mix from, I believe, Dragon, as well as maybe Academy markings. Again, it's hard to say they were just a grab bag from my spare bin, but I was able to cobble the markings together to the format that we see here. For the rear fenders, you notice that there are a star on each of these fenders. These would be present on vehicles, again, from this era. This would include several other stars, some numbers, and I also went ahead and threw on from the kit supply markings, the two white stripes, which on the kit are meant for the Israeli version of this model, but American vehicles from this era did the same thing. After all the worst slide decals were added, the entire model was coated with VMS matte varnish. And again, I've mentioned this product before in the past for really good reasons. Throughout the filming of this video, I stated on several occasions that this is not the first go ahead that I've had at one of these monogram M48A2 kits and that I built one years ago in my youth. Well, that model is still in my collection and can be seen right here. This model I've built back in the earlier mid 1990s and I was about seven or eight years old when I built this model for the first time. The model though was not necessarily in this configuration. The model was built 
in a way that looked very similar to this. However, about 18 or so years ago, the model fell in a bad state of disrepair, so I went ahead and restored it to the condition that we see it here. Basically, many of the techniques that I touched upon that went into this build here were first pioneered when I built this model all those years ago. Another thing that I touched upon earlier in this video is that the model is 132nd scale. Although the box erroneously refers to it as 135, realistically the kit is 132nd. If there was only a way I could compare and contrast the 135th scale with the 132nd in order to see just how close these two scales really are. Wait, oh, wait, what's that? You hear that? Oh, hey, look who it is. In case anyone is wondering, this one over here is a 135th scale Tamiya pattern M48A3. Specifically, this one is the Academy copy, but more information on that is discussed in the model showcase video for this particular build. Essentially, this is a Tamiya 135th scale M48A3, and I'm going to use this to illustrate exactly how close it is compared to the 132nd scale counterpart. Here you'll definitely see and understand why for the longest period of time this kit here was considered to be a viable option if you were in the, the market looking for a 135th scale patent based vehicle. With the camera off the tripod you can see how the models stack up when lined up side by side. Note the monogram is slightly longer compared to the 135th scale Tamiya. The turrets look very similar, but the monogram is slightly bigger in proportions in comparison to the Tamiya counterpart. If you stack the two vehicles side by side, you'll see an interesting quirk found on the Tamiya model that is actually one aspect that the monogram kit is superior, and that is with the vehicle's height. The Tamiya M48 pattern has this interesting quirk where the vehicle sits higher than it's actually supposed to. The monogram in comparison is at the appropriate height for this pattern of vehicle. The reason why the Tamiya one has this quirk is mentioned in more depth in the model showcase video for this one here, but needless to say, the stock Tamiya kit sits too tall. But when you compare it with the 132nd scale monogram, it's actually the exact same height. This is partially due to the fact that the vehicle is sitting taller than it's supposed to be, and since 132 and 135 are so close, the taller stance makes up for the difference. And now that you can see the two models compared side by side, you can see why this model here has stood the test of time and has continued to be relevant for as long as it has. This model here can be easily upgraded with the detail parts from this one, which there are plenty of. Because Monogram did such a good job with coming up with the overall proportions and spec for this particular kit, this also makes it very adaptable and without a whole lot of extra elbow grease, you can really spice this one up with many of the detail parts which were originally intended for this one. This kept the vehicle relevant for as long as it has because this was the only option available to you, the builder, of a plastic kit version of the M48A2 patent. The M48A2 was a very noteworthy vehicle in its own right because of not only its US military usage, but also because this vehicle was widely exported out to other NATO countries. And yes, if you were looking to build an A2 in one flavor or another, it was still an easier proposition to roid up one of these older monogram kits here than it was to take one of the Tamiya ones and backdate it to the A2 configuration. Although the two vehicles are M48s and look very similar to one another, there are some significant differences with the tin work as well as some other smaller fittings that are found on the vehicles. And if anyone's wondering just what are these differences, well that's odd the scope of this video and that honestly could be an entire subject matter for a video on its own. At the end of the day, I am really thrilled on how this one turned out. These old school monogram M48 A2 patent kits always were something that I always had a soft spot for because again, I built one when I was much younger than I am now. But again, they also build into a really nice representation of the M48 A2. The stock model is very basic, again, due to the age of the tooling. However, it's not too far gone where you can add just a few little spices here or there to really kick it up to a whole new level which I guess tilts us into the skill level and recommendation. This model here is 
a model that I can recommend to a beginner. However, you do want to take your time with the assembly of the lower hull for the reasons that I mentioned earlier in this video. If you take your time, you should be able to get the hull assembled and built into the basic rendition of the stock kit. And since I literally built this model as a beginner when I was about eight or so years old, I can attest that yes, a beginner can definitely tackle one of these models. This model here can also be built, of course, by anyone who has more advanced skill sets from anyone who's a intermediate to an advanced range individual. However, someone from the latter is going to probably feel a little bored with working with one of these models here, again, due to the age of the tooling. However, if you are one of those individuals, chances are really good. You do have a ton of spare parts just loitering around in your spare parts bin that really aren't doing anything. And with just sprinkling a few of these little details on this model over here, this is a way to improve it immensely from the original offering. Sliding into recommendations, an obvious one would be anyone who's a diehard patent fan. If you're the type of guy that loves the patent tank family from the M46 all the way up to the M60, this kit here is a strong recommendation for you. Like I stated earlier on in this video, for the longest period of time, if you were looking for a 135th-ish scale M48A2 Patton, the old school Revell Monogram kit here was the only option in town. In recent years, there have been some newcomers to the field that are filling the role that was once left exclusively to this old kit here. Because of these new renditions, and undoubtedly I'm pretty sure there are going to be some other new options coming on the market as the years go on, this vehicle here is going to start falling more and more towards irrelevance. However, having said that, these models are still have an interesting niche in the marketplace, being a kit for beginners as well as also just old time collectors to build and enjoy. The model itself goes together very well, very easily. And again, gives you a nice little rendition of a M4882 patent to add to your collection. Along with the patent fans, if anyone out there is a fan of just American tanks in general, as well as post-war era vehicles, this kit here is another no-brainer. One benefit that this kit does have, however, is because it's been on the market for as long as it has, the availability for one of these kits here are extremely easy, and because of which the cost of getting into one is very low. This opens up this kit to a wide market for individuals to purchase, build, and to enjoy. Because of the lower cost, this model here I would recommend for anyone who's re-entering into the world of armor modeling. If you're the type of person that built probably this exact same kit in years past, but are looking to re-enter into the armor modeling world, but you don't want to jump right into a kit that might be overly complicated, this old school kit here is a good way to reacclimate yourself with a lot of your skill sets. After completing one of these builds here, you could then see where your skill sets lie, and from there you could springboard off of this to other kits that are on the market, be it the Tamiya M48A3, or some of the other more advanced kits that I touched upon earlier. And of course, of the model subject matter, I cannot recommend this kit enough for anyone who is an avid fan of building and collecting vintage plastic tank model kits. This kit here is just like the Tamiya Panther Alpha A kit, where it's just a living, breathing trilodite. And, well, you cannot call yourself a vintage tank model kit collector unless you have at least one of these monogram patents in your stash or under your belt. Of course, however, this kit is not for everyone. If you're the type of person that is a River County perfectionist, this kit is not going to be to your taste. If you're one of those individuals, I would recommend steering clear from this one here and just opting for the, those other two renditions that I previously mentioned. This model kit, of course, is a vintage kit, no bones about it, and it does have some inherent weaknesses because of the age of the tooling. But again, if you can look past some of those issues, then the model here actually makes for a nice enjoyable build, and it's one that will add some value to your collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 132nd scale vintage monogram M48A2 patent tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posts and content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been published on this channel in the past. 
Finally, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching. See you next time.